All right, so let's get started. Again, uh, well, I'm not sure. A reminder to people on uh, YouTube that Claudia's slides will probably soon be posted. Raymond can confirm that maybe. Maybe, yes. All right, um, and for everyone else there in the chat here. So we're lucky to have Claudia Scheinbauer tell us about extending topological field theory. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. And um, it's really too bad that we can't all be together in beautiful Brazil, hopefully next time. So what I'm gonna be talking about today um, is, well, partially joint work with Owen William. That was a paper from a couple of years ago. And then the last part will be uh, about ongoing work in progress uh, with Dan Fried and Constantin Zimmermann. So what is our program for today? I'll first start uh, with the main players in this talk, namely um, revision of a functorial approach to fun uh, topological field theories. And the main key mathematical tools here will be higher categories, which we will use on a very informal level. But if you have uh, more technical questions about that, I'm happy to answer them. Um, we will talk about what a suitable target for these functors are. And then we will look at a specific class of those targets, namely so-called Merida categories, and uh, look at dualizability in them. And then finally, we'll have an outlook on this ongoing work in progress uh, on enlarging one of these Merida categories uh, for Russia to control here. All right, so that's our plan. So let's start with a bit of a revision, some topological field theories. as functors. Um, so by the way, I posted in the chat before, so maybe Raimundo could post it again, a link to um, Dropbox where the notes that I'm writing right now are should be automatically updated. So if you wanna scroll back up, uh, feel free to go there to, to see what I wrote above. Okay, so topological field theories as functors. So the following approaches by many people, of course, uh, Atia and Siegel. And then we'll see the extended versions um, following people like Ruth Lawrence, Jacob Lur, and many, many others. So for us, an n-dimensional topological field theory Uh, is an assignment uh, which sends an n-dimensional. I guess I should start with a lower dimension, so um, a closed n minus one dimensional manifold is sent to a vector space, usually over C, but whatever. And an n dimensional cobordism is sent to a linear map. So, well, in this audience, I'm sure this is not new, but uh, what you should think of this is the state space. And this is the evolution operator. And let me draw a picture of such a, well, what are the closed n minus one dimensional manifolds in dimension two? They're just circles. And then an n-dimensional cobordism. We have something like the picture I drew outside of the string math 
thing at the top. But we also have to say a little bit more. So we have to say uh, mycobordism that will be, we will view this as a morphism in a category. So I have to say, what is the source? N minus one dimensional manifold. So I will indicate these by little arrows. And what's the target? So these will be the outgoing ones. And then maybe we can decorate these uh, manifolds with things like an orientation. So maybe I have some orientation, maybe I should flip one around. And then also our big manifold, our cobordism um, is endowed with an orientation. Okay, so I, I said assignment. So it should be a functor. That's what the first blue line said. So it should be, uh, Functor, and as such, it is symmetric monoidal. So it sends the disjoint union to the tensor product. Okay, so far so good. Um, But now it's a functor of what? So the way I wrote it here, it's a functor of my structure here is that of a category. My objects are my closed M minus one dimensional manifolds. And I view my cobordism that I drew here as a functor from this side. So from the two circles to the outgoing circles. So it's just a functor of a symmetric mineral category. Um, however, we can try to modify this definition. So actually, I should do this differently. Split my screen. This is not what I wanted. I apologize. Okay, so let's repeat our, our definition here. And now we'll modify it a little bit. And so the underlying reason why we're doing this is, well, from a geometric point of view, the fact that we're singling out n and n minus one dimensional things is a bit odd. And there are many other reasons as well, which we will get to later. And so basically, in this, in this example um, of n equals two, we can chop our circle into further pieces. So for example, I just decompose it into two pieces. But now here I have points. So we need info about points as well. And now this here is now a one-dimensional cobordism. Okay, so how do we incorporate this into the definition above? This will now be called an extended n-dimensional topological field theory. And so we just saw that um, our what used to be the closed manifold, now we also decomposed. So in fact, here we will have n minus one dimensional cobordisms as well. And then we will have n minus two dimensional cobordisms. And so on, and eventually we will get down to points, zero dimensional ones. Okay, but now we said it's a, it should be a symmetric monoidal functor. So, well, first of all, what do we want to assign to these things? It should be some generalization of what we already had. And what's the structure? Now, I want to organize these guys into a nice structure so I can just summarize the properties that I have.
And what just turns out to be convenient mathematically is the structure of an infinity n category. So this was, uh, yeah, one paper filling in the details of this it was something I did a couple of years ago with Demia Kalak. Okay, so maybe one thing to mention here is that these cobordisms, now I just wrote cobordisms, these might have corners. So another example, just so that you have another example in mind, two-dimensional example would be, this is not a very good example, something like this. So these now have corners. Okay, so a big question one may ask uh, when looking at topological field theories is, well, if we're given a partition function or some invariant of manifolds, can we find a topological field theory that describes this thing that, well, we can recover at the top as uh, endomorphisms of the, the ground field. Um, and then we might go further and say, well, if we know what our TFT does at the top, can we actually extend down? So can we find extended TFTs? And a reason why this might be interesting is the question, well, is this TFT that you're looking at, is it local? And we'll see in a moment why this has something to do with locality. Okay, but here's a big question mark. So the first thing I would like to um, talk about now well, actually, maybe let's let's look at this first. What does this mean? This extended field theories are local. Well, this is described by the famous um, famed cobordism hypothesis, which says that if we take NTFTs valued in some infinity n category C, I should be more precise here. I should write framed. Then these are in correspondence with n dualizable objects in C. So I can just take my target C. I, I'm, this, is, this will be C, this target. I can take my target C and find objects with a certain property, namely being n dualizable. So the reason this is locality is because that object will be attached to a point. So really the whole theory is fully determined by what happens at a point. So this really reflects locality. Okay, but for this to make uh, the, the to, to find interesting examples, the first question is, well, what do we put here on the right-hand side? Okay, we have to find um, meaningful versions of C that um, will help us. So this is unfortunately a choice and there are different choices that we could make, um, but we do have one desired property. Um, is well, we want to recover vector, maybe super vector spaces or some other linear variation, so chain complexes or whatever, at the top two levels. And well, we can express this in saying that this should be the endomorphisms in C of some morphism. So this, this we often just write as the loop so we just look and at endomorphisms of the identity of one as a n minus two morphism, and then we should get back vector spaces. But that's just a fancy way of expressing that here we really want um, vector spaces or super vector spaces. Okay, so let's look at an example. So a particular TFT that you might be interested in is the Turai Viru theory. And this indeed is a three, two, one, zero extended. So here I'm just listing the dimensions that appear. 
uh, and it takes values in three category that will be called fuge for fusion categories. And that will sit actually in something larger, which we will look at in more detail. So this will reappear later, this right-hand thing. Um, and I should mention some names here. So this was proven by, I mean, this way of proving it using the probordism hypothesis was done by Chris Douglas, Chris Shama Priest, Noah Snyder. So what is this uh, category fuge? So I cheated a little bit here and I pre-wrote this and I wrote too much, I guess. <laughs> so my objects are fusion categories. My one morphisms will be bimodule categories. So these are linear categories which, on which the fusion categories act. So fusion categories are monoidal. So you can think of them as algebras. And so for these algebras, we have bimodules. And two morphisms are linear functors. And three morphisms are natural transformations between them. So indeed, we have that if we loop this twice, then we get back vector spaces, or at least the finite dimensional ones. So this is, this is the first challenge. And for to arrive zero, um, what these authors proved is that if you take any fusion category, the fusion category is three dualizable. So I can put a three in here. So I get a 3D TFT. Emily, when did I start? Seven minutes past the half hour. Right? Seven minutes past the half hour. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, great. So let me explain to you why I said this land, this, this is something in this bigger thing, Algecat. So here, the difference here is that here we have fusion categories, whereas in this side, we just look at tensor categories. And so these are just, um, you can view them as algebra, objects in k linear categories, if you wish, if you make this precise. Okay, so let's look at um, other choices of targets we can make here at this point. So this um, algebra of cats is a higher Merida category. We have Merida because we have some algebras and some bimodules. And so now we have a generalization Well, now we replace that one by an N, make this a little bit bigger. Um, and so here now, my objects are what are called EN algebras, which are the local, you should think of as being the local, local observables of an NTFT, okay? So to the point in my, my theory should attach the local observables of the NTFT. That's a particularly simple um, situation. So I should mention this thing was constructed in three separate works. The old names. Joint with Damien Perlac, and then there was a paper by Rune Helksing, and then there was another construction by Theo Johnson Friday and myself. All right, so this, this N here is always the same N. Okay, so what are EN algebras? <clears throat> Why are these the local observables? So EN algebras in, say, topology you parametrize some operations by insertions of disks into a big disk. 
So this gives me a multiplication from A tensor A tensor A to A. But maybe a Bordism way of thinking about this is you should just think of this as like a, a triple pair of pants. And why does this show up of the local observables? Well, if we take some manifold, and then, well, locally, this looks exactly like this. I can insert exactly this picture. Okay, so we wanted to get some TFT. So let's try to apply the cobordism hypothesis now to these targets. And so this is a theorem. I guess maybe I should make this a bit smaller. Um, by Owen William and myself uh, in this family of targets. Every, oh, I should just not take in cats. We can generalize this actually and, and allow something, something bigger here. This is some higher category itself. Um, I call this S. Okay, so in this target, no matter what the N is, no matter what the S is, every object is N dualizable. So this might sound fantastic first because, well, we wanted n dualizable objects to get n TFTs. The problem is that the n is just a little off for what we actually would want. So if you think of this category fuge here, we're just in Alge 1. So this theorem only tells us that we get a 1D TFT. And well, this should be a 3D TFT. Um, but at least this works in all generality. And Moreover, uh, previously we had shown that this is given by factorization homology. Which means that now you can use our theorem and you know which uh, conditions you have to check if you want to get higher, higher dualizability. So now we know from the theorem everything we need for n. And then if you want to go to n plus one, we also have explicit constructions of the things that you need to check them for higher dimensions. Okay, so what's the main tool for the situation? For this construction of these higher categories, uh, these are factorization algebras. particularly nice ones, uh, namely constructible ones. So if you have never seen what a factorization algebra is, well, first of all, these pictures here, that already is a factorization algebra, in this case on R2. But what they are, are they are certain Cauchy's, namely for something called the Weiss topology. So it's not a normal Cauchy, but a funny twisted one. And they're really the structure that you get um, for the observables of the quantum field theory. Okay, that's, that's how you should think of them. Okay, great. So what are our, um, how does our higher category look like? And so I'll just explain two examples for you. So they should be constructible, which means that I have to tell you what the space is that they lie on. And so for n equals two here, n equals two, that's exactly these types of pictures here. Um, my objects will be constructible factorization algebras just on a little box, if you wish. For a one morphism, we add a codimension one defect. For two morphisms, we add a codimension one defect and a, another one in it. Um, and we'll get back to this picture in a moment. So what about n equals three? 
Here now, we again have an empty box. And then for one morphisms, we have a co-dimension one defect. For two morphisms, we add a co-dimension two defect. And then and finally, we can add a point. So hopefully you can imagine what, um, what the pattern is here. All right. Great, so what is composition in this uh, thing? So composition is given by colliding these defects. And the nice thing here is that we can do string diagram um, type arguments. So, Okay, right, so we'll go to the first picture here. Maybe let's analyze this a little bit more. Maybe before we go into more details here, are there any questions at this point? So let me tell you a little bit more about how these uh, factorization algebras work. So on the left-hand side, you see a picture which depicts a one morphism. So I just drew the underlying uh, stratification, the underlying stratified space. And what you should think of is um, on the left-hand side, well, what can we do on the left-hand side? We can include little open sets into bigger open sets, which will give us the, the E2 structure. And the same on the right-hand side. So this is my E2 structure. And then in the middle, I can include something on the left and let it act on the thing in the middle. So this, this will give me my bimodule structure. This is my module structure. Or I could have also included it on the other side. So in the two morphism setting now, we have a line and a dot in the middle. So now we have four diff five different basic little disks that we can insert, namely the blue and the red as before. But now there are three different types of disks, which are on the line with the point in the middle. So now in the left-hand picture, I actually have another situation that I didn't draw before. Namely, I could also insert two little disks on the line and include a big one around it. So I will also have a structure happening here, which is just basically including two in something big, which is gives me an algebra structure. So let's go back to our motivating example. We said we had a fusion category, which was an algebra object in CAT. So my fusion category can be something that lives on this line because this algebra structure will be encoded here by this inclusion of disks. So another example for two now to match up with the pictures will be alt two of cat, where my objects are these funny E2 things. But these are very familiar. These are just braided monoidal categories or braided tensor categories. Okay. 
And then one morphisms now would be tensor categories for bimodules and so on. So why I'm repeating this is because that naturally leads us to having a natural home for something else that um, pops up in, in TFT world, namely particular braided tensor categories or modular tensor categories, which will reappear later. So this, this goes on until three. Okay, so what about those string diagrams? Um, I will just show you a picture of how one would go about proving a theorem like this. So the theorem says that every object is as endualizable. Well, I didn't tell you what endualizable means, um, but hopefully you can still appreciate that it has something to do with string diagrams. So the main picture is this one. So we want to show that this one morphism has what's called an adjoint. So this adjoint now should look the other way around. It should go from red to blue. Okay. So. And there should be something in the middle. And how do I produce this? And how do I see? Um, how do I see this? So my claim is that the snake relation that you need to show when you need to show that something has an adjoint is exactly this picture here. So what we can do with factorization algebras is we can push them forward. I can take this factorization algebra here. And now I can push it forward along a diffeomorphism, which sends this stratified space to this one here. I can choose a diffeomorphism like that. So here we have now phi star f on this stratified space. But of course, the stratified space is diffeomorphic via sigma to just the one on the right, namely just by pulling up the strings. Right? So how do I get anything meaningful from this picture on the left? Um, how do I get anything that lies in this algebra n? Thing, it should correspond to actually a two morphism. So this should have a local picture like here or, or something like this of a line with a point. And so we can do a little trick here, namely, we can do another push forward where we take everything between lines like such and collapse them away to a point. And we take everything between lines in the other direction and collapse away. And if you look at what happens now I, outside of this, there I just have my blue left or my red left as before. So if I push forward, I indeed, I get a, a factorization algebra like, uh, like the one exhibited here. But now I also had a diffeomorphism from this guy over here. And indeed, these have to be the same.
And the right-hand side is just an identity. And this here is the composition required in the snake relation for uh, having duals or for having adjuncts. So hopefully the takeaway message here is that you can do a sort of string calculus with these pictures. Um, one can play around with these push forwards and produce new objects, new morphisms and have a string, string calculus type argument. Okay, great. So that's, that's for this theorem, but I said before, well, this is not really where we wanna stop. This is um, n-dualizable. Actually, in these categories, we would hope to get a lot more dualizability. For instance, in this fusion case, we don't want one dualizability, we want three dualizability. We're in a three category, one, three, two, one extended field. Um, okay, so are these targets optimal? And no, they're actually far from being optimal. So we have a nice uh, family of targets which work in certain special cases like in the Torah Bureau situation. But for instance, in the Reshetik and Torayev theory, um, this is not a good target, this does not work. So what's Reshetik and Torayev? We start with a modular tensor category. And we get a three to one TFT. And this is valued in some linear categories. That's also a nice target that I didn't mention before. So this is known. And now there are some things I would like to, to note. So if the modular tensor category is the so-called Drinfeld center, for A, a fusion category, then my Reshetik and Torayev theory associated to M is just the same as the Torayev Vero theory for A. So, this guy here we saw before is fully extended. So this was up here. This is extended all the way down to points. Um, so the right-hand side is as well, but not every modular tensor category arises this way. Okay, um, another comment I would like to make as a side remark is that actually for invertible TFTs, so anomalies, if you wish, we actually know a universal target. So this is due to um, alphabetical order of Fried and Hopkins. Um, well, sigma IC star. And I mean, in some sense, we would really like to aim to actually have some sort of a universal best target for non-invertible TFTs as well. I mean, today, to, at the moment, the answer is not yet, but hopefully that's, that's a, a guiding property that we would like to have. Um, and the last thing I would like to mention is that we can uh, find 
Russia to contour IF theory for an MTCM as a relative field theory. So there are two ingredients into this. So the first ingredient is the anomaly. So the anomaly is that M is four dualizable in this target ALG2 of cats that we mentioned before. So this is due to Rochier, Jordan, Powell, who just gave the talk before, Pavel Sakhanov and Noah Snyder. And then the second ingredient is that we can use a classification of relative field theories, similarly to this Kaborism hypothesis that's down here, to actually get um, that M as a viewed as a module for itself is relatively dualizable. So I should mention this has not been worked out in detail. Um, maybe that's a little side remark to make here. But we can use two things. So either there's a, a conjecture by Lurie classifying these things in the famous Kaborism hypothesis paper. And then there's also a classification of a related notion um, due to Theo Johnson Fried and myself. Okay, great. So in the last couple of minutes, I would like to give an outlook on what we could do now. So we have Rishi chicken drive theory now as a relative field theory, um, but actually we would like to get this as an actual extended field theory. And well, we saw where I told you that it doesn't work um, with target fusion categories, but maybe we can still do something. So fusion is too small. Well, let's just enlarge it. It's a very naive approach to do or a very simple strategy to do, but that's, that's the main strategy. And so the reason for this is the following picture I would like to paint related to this uh, relative field theory um, picture. So as a relative field theory, My modular tensor category gives me um, a relative field theory, which I would like to denote like this. Relative theory. And one way you can imagine these, and this is this is this first approach that I meant by Lurie. This is one, this is two is relating these as boundary field theories. Um, right, so we have it as a relative field theory. So now we would like to simply trivialize this side. Um, this is an invertible field theory. It's actually, it's, it's, uh, it's an anomaly, it's really invertible. So it's not too far away from being trivial. There's only one trivialization we have to do. And so the idea is to make this bigger where now indeed M becomes equivalent 
to vect. So the problem here, there are several problems or difficulties, challenges. Um, well, we want C to not just be anything, we want C to be somehow tractable, computable. Um, and well, C has to be symmetric monoidal. So, but let's assume we have this C. Uh, what we would then get, and this is this is a piece of information I have to tell you. If I have something going from vec to vec, actually we get something valued in the looping of C. So the looping of this alg2 is the alg1 that we were looking at before. So this looping of C will be an enlargement of my category fuge that I had before. So this is this is the fuge that, that appeared earlier on, fusion categories. And so here the challenge really is to, to, to find the symmetric mineral structure. And in my last minutes, I'll just say we use the relative theory for this. Okay, great. So the naive way to use the relative field theory, I mean, there, there are some things that you have to do then to, to show that it really indeed is a symmetric monoidal structure, to show that the pentagon relation holds, to show that the symmetry holds these things. So there you, you, you need to work quite a bit and that's where we're not finished yet, but, uh, but that's ongoing work in practice. All right, I would like to stop here and thank you very much for the attention. Thanks, Claudia. So let's all thank the speaker. And does anyone have a question? So I can you just explain at the last so you 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 know what C should be now? Yeah, so the, the idea is to enlarge, well, let's go to the looping rather. We enlarge our category fusion by exactly one thing, which will be this isomorphism here. This is X. So basically we formally add an X, which will be the identification between the modular tensor category and VEX. Um, just as you know, with polynomial rings, you just add a formal variable in some sense, but then you need to make sure, and this, this should be the dual. And then you need to make sure, I should have said that, uh, such that X tensor Y, you get back the modular tensor category that we started with. So, so X should be the value at the point. It's a very formal procedure. Um, this is adding this, but the task is really to ensure that this holds, which will ensure that the value at the circle then is the modular tensor category, um, and to make this into a symmetric monoidal structure that this holds. At right. The same time. right. So that tells you what the tensor product should be, and then you're checking all the compatibility. Exactly. But as you know, for a higher category, these compatibilities are involved and you have to have a good strategy for doing that. Sure. Right. Pavel has a question. Uh, thanks. Hi, Claudia. So um, can you mention, um, right. So you said that the Rushing drive theory can be considered as a, as a relative field theory to this four dimensional anomaly theory. Mm -hmm. uh, are, are you just checking dualizability or do you also have statements about orientation? Ah, yeah, no. Um, 
yes, at this point, checking dualizability. As a next step, of course, we would like to check orientation, but at the moment, I don't know how to, how precisely to do this um, with the homotopy statements. Yes, absolutely. And what happens when you have a non simple MTC where you still have an anomaly theory? Is, is there? Yeah. That I don't know. That's actually something I wanted to ask you guys so <laughs> uh, what exactly the, the conditions are that you need for the, I mean, where the non simple simplicity comes in. That's something mm. I would like to discuss with you guys at some point. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Claudia again. And uh, take a break for lunch. Thank you. Thank you.